Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Battle of Guandu, Three Kingdoms by Kings and Generals. Now, I don't know too much about the topic of this video, so this will be more of a learning reaction. I understand this was an era of Chinese history focused around these three kingdoms, and that there was a lot of infighting and warfare. This video was requested by one of our wonderful patrons. Thank you so much for all of the support, by the way. And just a side note, I'm a little sick right now, so if I have to clear my throat or if my voice sounds a little bit off, that is why. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. The Han Dynasty of China had endured for over four centuries. Yet as time progressed, its monarchs became more apathetic, while its officials ever more self-serving and corrupt. Mm. And you know, to my understanding, this is a process we sort of see repeated in Chinese history, and honestly repeated around the world throughout history. You know, you develop a new system, a new style of government, it becomes the status quo, and then over a period of time, it becomes more stagnant, less dynamic, corruption starts to filter in, and you get to the point where the system sort of falls in uh, under the weight of itself. You know, it can no longer exist. It's become too corrupt, the rulers don't care about the people, it's not willing to change anymore, and after that, well, we get periods often of chaos, civil war, violence, the, the sort of stuff we see, or I imagine we're going to see in this video. Thus, by the end of the second century, the Han was only a shell of its former self. Though all still claimed nominal allegiance to the Emperor, true power now lay in the regional warlords, capable of taking advantage of an ever-weakening central government. Mm. This video is brought to you by Total War Three Kingdoms, oh. a brand new strategy <laughs> game that combines a gripping turn-based campaign. Oh, that's a pretty fitting sponsor, huh? <laughs> pain of empire building, statecraft, and conquest with stunning real-time battles. And you know, you guys know the deal. Please go and check out this video by Kings and Generals. Go give them a like. Check out their sponsor. Basically, show them some support for making this fantastic content. The ongoing rebellions had resulted in the empowerment of General Dong Zhuo in 184. He was charged with restoring order to the realm, and by 189 his task was complete. Yet with the army at his back, Dong Zhuo did not stand down, and marched on the two capitals of the empire. Initially, Dong burned the eastern capital Luoyang to the ground, and then situated himself within the walled western capital Chang'an, thus seizing power for himself. Deposing the sitting emperor and placing a child in his stead, Dong Zhuo initiated a reign of terror as cruel as it was short-lived. Uh -oh. After little more than two years, his second-in-command, Lu Bu, finally turned on him and assassinated him in 192. Yeah, and, you know, that's the sort of chaos and infighting that I was talking about. And, you know, we see this a lot of times throughout history when we enter into this era of political chaos, when sort of centralized authority breaks down and a country becomes a roiling mass of conflict, people like these, basically warlords, become very powerful. And, you know, you basically can't trust anybody. At any moment, you might get stabbed in the back, betrayed, your allies may turn on you. So this is something that is common many, many times throughout history, and I'm probably going to be drawing a lot of those more general comparisons because, like I said, I really know nothing about this topic, so all of these names, a lot of these places, these events, I am learning as we go. Dong Zhuo's tyranny had forged an unlikely alliance of regional warlords to oppose him, but they were united only in their hatred of the mad general. Thus, with his execution, the coalition fragmented. In the northeast of China were Yuan Shao and Cao Cao, two of the region's most powerful warlords. Both of these men held sufficient forces to be able to offer protection to the underage Emperor Xian of Han, thereby ensuring their own ability to rule in the boy king's name. Mm. While you are yeah, now we have a system where we basically have a whole lot of warlords 
fighting over what little legitimacy remains with the Emperor. You know, this reminds me a little bit of the Sengoku Jidai in Japanese history or other similar times in other countries where, you know, the Emperor in this case or the King or whoever it may be, the person who is technically in charge actually has very little real power and they become a figurehead, a puppet to be passed around amongst uh, a cadre of powerful generals or warlords. Fan Xiao debated the wisdom of such an action. Cao Cao moved first, spiriting the young emperor away from his place of refuge in the ruins of Luoyang to his own fortress at Shu in Yan province. Safely ensconced within Shu and using edicts stamped with the emperor's own seal, Cao Cao spent much of 196 to 200 bringing the other northern warlords to heel. All right. He's expanding. This process was greatly aided in 197, when southern China splintered into multiple warring states. Yuan Shao had meanwhile realized that his slowness to act had likely cost him the empire. Thus, he began to plot how he could reclaim it from hmm. his former ally. You can see just how much this era revolves around individual warlords from the fact that, you know, look at all these different colored provinces or territories. They just have the name of the guy in charge emblazoned over them. You know, really shows you, gives you an idea of what exactly is going on here. We basically have warlords who are very regionally powerful fighting with each other to try and gain some sort of national power, national control. Both clearly understood that there wasn't enough room in the north for two ambitious warlords with dreams of empire. It was in the year 200 that the building friction between the two former comrades erupted into full-scale conflict. The location of the primary battle, Guandu, was significant oh. because it was situated near the Yan Ford of the Yellow River All right, we're getting and to the, on battle. the road to Cao Cao's capital, Shu. This made it a key staging point for both militaries to control in order to further their objectives. Okay, this is an important location. As early as August of 199, Cao Cao realized the critical importance of holding Fort Duxi on the southern bank of the main crossing of the Yellow River. Thus, he stationed a garrison there to expand and improve its defenses in preparation for the inevitable conflict with Yuan Shao. There was a clear difference in the strength of each side. Whoa. Cao Cao fielded a respectable force of some 40,000. My goodness, we got 40,000 versus 110,000. And that is the thing about a lot of Chinese history. Now, I am not that familiar with Chinese history. It is not my area of expertise. There's so much I don't know. But one thing I do know <laughs> is that, you know, I'll hear about some rebellion or some battle in Chinese history and an equivalent battle at the same time in European history might have involved a couple thousand people, maybe a couple tens of thousands. But when you put it into the context of Chinese history, all of a sudden it's involving, you know, at least a hundred thousand people, often hundreds of thousands or even millions. Just the amount of people we're talking about shoots up whenever we're talking about China versus other regions of the world. Uh, and that stands true here. You know, this is a pretty large-scale engagement, though 110,000 versus 40,000, you know, very badly outnumbered. <laughs> but was dwarfed by Yuan Shao's coalition of more than 110,000, including 10,000 heavy cavalry. The moment for Yuan Shao to strike came in the first month of 200, with an unexpected turn of events. The governor of Shu province in the south, Liu Bei, rebelled against his lord Cao Cao's control oh. and pledged himself to Yuan Shao's heart. Dude, Cao Cao is in a lot of trouble. I mean, I don't know how this battle is going to turn out, but he is badly outnumbered. Now he's facing rebellions. Yeah, I don't know, but he's facing a tricky situation. Brother. As Cao Cao hurried to redeploy his armies and deal with this betrayal, he gambled that Yuan Shao was not yet ready to attack. Therefore, he personally led the expedition against Liu Bei, leaving his lieutenant Yu Jin in command of Du Shi. Okay, that is a this gamble. Left the northern border of Yan exposed, an opportunity Yuan Shao could scarcely afford to ignore. 
With Cao Cao absent, Yuan felt he could easily seize control of Yan province, along with the emperor himself. He immediately mobilized his massive army to the crossing at Yan Ford. Yeah, I mean, look, now is the time to strike. It seems like Cao Cao, you know, he's sort of holding more important, more central territory. And by more central, I mean uh, more politically central. And so he has a lot of issues to deal with. This is a pretty prime opportunity to take some of his territory and, like they said, perhaps also the emperor. Here, hoping to establish a beachhead on the southern bank, he dispatched a vanguard of 4,000 infantry and cavalry to seize the river crossing. It was here that Cao Cao's early preparations in reinforcing Fort Duxi were rewarded. Mm. In spite of Cao Cao's absence, the entrenched forces of Guan Du repeatedly rebuffed Yuan Shao's initial attempts. All right, all right. Though they were vastly outnumbered, with only 2,000 defenders in all, the narrow confines of the ford negated Yuan Shao's numerical advantage. The commander of Fort Duxi, though, knew that their luck would not hold if Yuan launched his full strength against them. Reinforcements arrived under command of Yu Jin with a detachment of 2,000 men. Liu Bei's rebellion against Cao Cao disintegrated almost immediately, hmm. with the traitorous warlord fleeing first south and ultimately into the protection and employ of Yuan Shao. Damn, okay, Cao Cao managed to put down this rebellion pretty quickly. Now we can head right back to Guangdu and deal with the real problem, which is Yuan Shao trying to cross the river. Now, of course, if you're talking about a river crossing, the advantage goes to the defender. It's a whole lot easier to defend against a river crossing than actually, you know, participate in one. That comes with a lot of issues, but, you know, Cao Cao is badly outnumbered, so if we want to look at the... Advantages that each side has, sort of up and down. He's extremely badly outnumbered, but he is on the defensive, which means he probably needs less men to defend than to attack. I don't know, it really could go either way. Despite his surprise attack failing to achieve the desired quick victory, and Cao Cao once again personally leading the defense of Yan, Yuan ignored advice to end his campaign. Instead, he and his army crossed the Yellow River downstream of Yan Ford and laid siege to Fort Boma. All right. Rather than directly aiding the besieged fort, Cao Cao led his armies in a feint up river toward Yan Ford. This fooled Yuan Shao into believing Cao's intent was to cross the river and attack his main camp. To defend against this, Yuan was forced to divert reinforcements bound for the siege of Boma and instead counter Cao Cao's purported river crossing. Cao Cao, however, had doubled back to. Hey, all right. Cao Cao's playing smartly. He's reading his opponent. He's playing the psychological game. Of course, you know, a lot of warfare is about on the ground tactics and strategy, but, you know, especially in a situation like this where you have two enemies face to face who are, you know, you're having some engagements, but a lot of the men are still holding back in one way or another. A lot of it is a psychological game, and that is what Cao Cao is doing right here. He's saying, all right, well, I'm going to fate in this direction, but actually head here, you know, you know, can you see what I'm trying to do? Or you, will you be tricked? That's the question. Strike at the enemy forces outside Bo Ma and lift the siege of the fortress. Cao Cao's army utterly routed the besiegers at Bo Ma, and in the course of the battle, Yuan Shao's general in charge of the siege was killed. Well, Never okay, so you know what? I talked about how both sides had different advantages, but Cao Cao was very badly outnumbered. But with how the battle has gone so far, and, you know, we still have a bit to go. I don't know how this is going to turn out. Cao Cao has played the game pretty intelligently. Seems to be doing a good job. He put down that rebellion, headed straight back. He's basically won himself a victory here, managed to uh, relieve this siege. So it's going pretty well for him so far. That could change, but so far. Nevertheless, Cao Cao, having decided that the fortress was no longer defensible, ordered his forces to withdraw southwest and take up their prepared positions at Guandu. Again trying to seize the initiative, Yuan Shao ordered a force of 6,000 cavalry to attack the retreating enemy and take them by surprise. 
Having been Yuan Shao's battlefield ally for many years, however, Cao Cao had anticipated such a maneuver. Mm. He thus ordered many of his soldiers to dismount and drop their weapons and valuables along the way. <laughs> As expected, the attacking cavalry were lured by the scattered roadside goods, yep. and they halted their pursuit. Brilliant! So first off, Cao Cao continues to win that psychological game, but... You know, they're sort of covering. He knows his enemy. He understands what he's going to do. Cao Cao is reading him very well. And also, that's just a clever little trick. Only the most disciplined troops throughout history, really up until the modern professionalization of a lot of armies, have been able to resist loot. I mean, really, if you look throughout most of history, most armies, if there's the opportunity to... Either not fight and go and grab loot, postpone fighting and go and grab loot, or, you know, leave the fight and go and grab loot, at least if you're victorious, will go and grab the loot. I mean, there are, you know, a lot of issues we can see, many battles throughout history, where one side is winning, they have the advantage, maybe they drive off a portion of the enemy's army, but they get distracted and go and loot instead of, say, pulling back around to finish things. So, you know, dropping some loot at the side of the road, that's a pretty good tactic. It'll lure the enemy right in, or at least slow him down. ...to collect the bounty. At that point, Cao Cao's own force of 600 elite cavalry ambushed them, ah, killing hundreds... Including there you go! He wasn't just slowing them down, he was luring them in. ...including their force commander and routing the rest. Guangdu and its fortress not only lay on the southern bank of the Bian River, south of the Yellow River, but was also ringed by a series of massive earthwork fortifications. Mm. These functioned as trenches, holding defenders within each concentric ring. Despite these formidable barriers, Yuan Shao decided not to set up siege lines and starve the defenders out, but to commit his army to storming Guangdu. Okay. His soldiers constructed massive siege platforms, taller than the earthwork barriers, from which archers would fire arrows down into the enemy. But Cao Cao now revealed his own counter-siege weapon, his mangonels, also known as traction trebuchets, capable of shattering the wooden platforms with ease. Oh wow! Yuan Shao's attempt to storm Guangdu's defenses was a failure. As Cao Cao countered Yuan Shao's every move, the Battle of Guangdu devolved into a stalemate. This was not, however, to Cao Cao's advantage, as his province was rapidly running low on food and supplies. Damn, okay, so Cao Cao's been doing a pretty damn good job so far. Like they said, he's responded to his opponent's every move. He's basically read his every move, seen it coming, but Cao Cao cannot afford to wait. His situation is currently deteriorating, and this is how it often is in these types of situations. You know, I think about... I mentioned it before, the Sengoku Jedi, or other examples. Honestly, you could think about China itself. Uh, it had, well, it's had many eras of warlord rule. I'm more familiar with sort of modern Chinese history, say 20th century. There was an era of warlord rule, but we have this situation where all these warlords control their sort of regional fiefdoms, basically. And then you might have one guy who controls the center of power, maybe controls the emperor or whoever else is supposed to be in charge, is supposed to have that legitimacy, but usually doesn't have much power at all. Now, controlling that center of political power, it gives you a little bit more clout and legitimacy. It might not give you that much more actual power, and it also puts you in a risky situation. It is pretty difficult to hold that center of power, to hold, say, the Emperor, because every other warlord is about to turn their weapon on you and go in. Now you're the target of everybody's attacks. It's pretty easy to allow, you know, your control of the province or your situation to deteriorate around you. It's a dangerous spot to be in. Without swift relief, starvation would force his defeat. Word reached Cao Cao that his means of salvation may have been found. Oh. He received a report that a mere 20 kilometers away, Yuan Shao's army had been stockpiling its own stores of grain at the nearby village of Gu Shi. Yet rather than attempting to seize the grain for his own soldiers, 
Cao Cao dispatched a small force of light cavalry to surround the village and incinerate it, grain oh. and all. Damn. This certainly did not help his own situation, but Cao Cao had wagered that it would cost Yuan Shao's army even more. Yeah, I mean, that's a gamble. That is a risky, risky move, but it's a gamble that I suppose Cao Cao was willing to take. He's, he's hurting both him and the enemy, but he's betting that it'll hurt the enemy more. You know, dangerous move, but Cao Cao, his judgment has been right so far, so maybe the right move. Especially given that his own supply lines had been extended deep within Cao's territory. Shortly thereafter, Yuan's own emergency reserves of supplies were indeed called to the front and stored at Wu Chao near Gushi. Mm. Yet it was lightly defended, and when one of Yuan's subordinates attempted to alert the warlord to that oversight, he was brushed aside, resulting in the miffed officer's defection to Cao Cao, where he informed <laughs> him of this new supply cache. By the way, that is the ultimate pettiness. You warn your leader that, hey, uh, this supply depot is actually not very well defended. He brushes you off, and in response, you go to the enemy to take advantage of that weakness. You know, how much more petty can you get? But I'd say that's a pretty good look into this era. Not that I know much about this era, but from what I understand, that is pretty typical. That sort of betrayal, that sort of chaos hopping from one side to the other. Yeah, pretty typical of this, you know, type of era of history. Though suspicious of this conveniently timed information, Cao Cao's army was nonetheless at a critical point and could not afford to ignore the opportunity. Mm. Cao Cao personally led a nighttime raid with 5,000 infantry and cavalry to capture or failing that destroy the Wu right. depot. Also, what a bold move from Cao Cao. <laughs> so, he had some supplies. He decided to destroy them which hurt both him and the enemy, forcing the enemy to bring supplies to the front. And now he's going to try and steal the enemy's supplies. An incredibly bold move. <laughs> Using the darkness and the expectation of an incoming relief force to their advantage, Cao Cao and his men quickly overran the defenders, and when recovery proved impractical, again set fire to the supplies. Damn, again? Holy. When word reached Yuan Shao that his granary had again been destroyed, <laughs> rather than attempting to save his supplies, he committed almost his entire army to storming the defenses at Guandu and achieving an immediate breakthrough. Okay. The battle raged on through the night at tremendous human cost, but as before, no significant gains were made against the fortress. Damn. Hey, I guess Cao Cao once again made the right call. This man is like, I'm not requisitioning any of this grain, I'm burning it all. <laughs> it might be risky for me, but apparently, and it seems like he's right, it hurts my enemy even more. And if I provoke him to fight, that's fine. I can win. And yeah, Cao Cao's been correct. When dawn broke the next morning, Yuan Shao's soldiers, already thoroughly demoralized by the loss of the last of their food, were horrified I'm sure. to discover that Cao Cao had ordered the lips and noses of the enemy Ugh. dead removed, mixed with pig entrails, and scattered on the outskirts of their comrades' camps. Oh god! As hopelessness swept the camps, two more commanders defected to Cao Cao, causing even more despair and confusion. Hey, that's another element of the psychological game. I mean, extremely brutal, frankly. Disgusting sounding, but... He's playing with his enemy's mind. It was at this moment that Cao Cao's counter-assault came. Launching his full strength at the exhausted and unsuspecting enemy camps, 20,000 Yan soldiers plowed into Yuan Shao's disorganized ranks, broke their lines, and caused the panicked soldiers to rout. Damn! By the end of the day, by Cao Cao's own, perhaps overblown, estimation <laughs> to Emperor Xian, sure. more than 70,000 of Yuan's 110,000 strong army lay dead, and the rest had been captured. My goodness, I mean, look, these powerful strongmen types often like to over-exaggerate their own successes, so take everything they say with the massacre and assault, but this does seem to have been 
a pretty impressive and decisive victory. The majority of these captives would subsequently be buried alive by oh, Cao Cao's Oh, God! Cao Cao! Jesus, man! <laughs> Though Yuan Shao himself had managed to slip away in the retreat with a force of 800 cavalry, his power across the north was broken. Yeah, he's he would done. die two years later, and his sons would quickly tear the remnants of his realm apart, Damn. making them easy targets for the armies of Cao Cao. In little more than five years' time, Cao Cao had gone from just one of many regional northern warlords to absolute ruler of the entire north. Yeah, look at him, my goodness. Look Our series on the conflicts of the three kingdoms will continue. So okay, we'll great. Um, fantastic. Like I said, uh, this was a recommendation from a patron. Uh, thank you so much for the support. And, uh, you know, hey, you can subscribe to the Patreon, subscribe at a particular tier if you want to recommend videos that you would like me to watch. Uh, this was an interesting one, something that I know basically nothing about, right? <laughs> you know... A lot of names that I am unfamiliar with, but some interesting stuff. Um, you know, I do find these eras of military and political chaos pretty fascinating. So yeah, some good stuff. Uh, I definitely enjoyed this one. If you guys did, please subscribe, leave a like, check out the Patreon, you know, all that good stuff. I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.